I'm Joe Lample. When I created Growing a Greener World, I had one goal, to tell stories of everyday people, innovators, entrepreneurs, forward-thinking leaders, who are all, in ways both big and small, dedicated to organic gardening and farming, lightening our footprint, conserving vital resources, protecting natural habitats, making a tangible difference for us all. They're real, they're passionate, they're all around us. They're the game changers who are literally growing a greener world and inspiring the rest of us to do the same. Growing a greener world, it's more than a movement, it's our mission. You know the old saying, sometimes you don't appreciate what you've got until it's gone? Well, such is the case with many of the seeds and plants our ancestors grew. Sadly, many are gone forever, and along with them, their flavor and beauty. And that's not all. As certain plants disappear from this earth, it disrupts and threatens the biodiversity that depend on them to keep things in balance. Heritage Farm is the home to Seed Savers Exchange in Decorah, Iowa, a growing global community of gardeners who since 1975 have shared hundreds of thousands of seed samples while in the process continue to build a network of people committed to its mission of collecting, growing, and distributing heirloom seeds and plants. That was the vision and dream of Seed Savers co-founder Diane Ott Whaley 35 years ago. Today, they have about 13,000 members who share that simple but important mission to help save the world's diverse but endangered garden heritage for future generations. You know, probably the most popular question or one of the most frequently asked questions is what is an heirloom? And the easiest way for me to explain that is to maybe compare it to an heirloom piece of furniture or a piece of jewelry, something that has been in the family and handed down from generation to generation. But there's a big difference with heirloom vegetables because they're alive. When we started Seed Savers 35 years ago, I don't think heirloom vegetables were even thought about or much less um, desired or even people didn't understand what they were. 35 years later, people are more aware of where their food comes from, they want to know where their food comes from, and that brings up a sensitive issue about where the seed comes from. Every seed has a story, and it's, a, it's up to us and family generations to keep that story alive with the seed. So not only are we growing seed to keep the seed viable, but we're also encouraging the story and how that seed was used and connecting that the, the seed with the food with the food to the garden. I grew up on a dairy farm about 20 miles from here and growing up one of the highlights of my childhood was going down to visit my grandparents and the highlight of that trip was usually sitting on a porch that my grandfather would have morning glories growing every year and he'd have them trained so that they, they with twine string that was what he only used so the twines would bring the morning glories up over the porch, but he'd always have a little opening, either triangle, circle, or square, so that we could sit and watch the cars go by. And I just would sit and listen to his stories, and I loved that little porch with the morning glories. When I had my first garden, uh, Kent, Kent Whaley and I had our first garden about five miles from where, where my grandparents lived, so we went to get seed from my grandfather. And he told us the story that his parents actually brought that seed over when they immigrated from Bavaria. So we started Seed Savers with that idea, just wondering if other people were out there had, who had family heirloom seeds that had no one to pass them on down to. And in the beginning, we didn't have listings of seeds, we had letters. We published everybody's letter that, that really brought the seed to life and put the seed in their life. And that's how we started, were just letters from people who you could tell loved what they were doing and were preserving because of a true love for what they had. Since 1900, more than 80% of the apple varieties of North America have been lost. Seed Savers Exchange has developed the most diverse public orchard in the U.S., where hundreds of pre-1900 apple trees are on display. Now here we are in this orchard. It's very historic, lots of generations of different apples, but this is different though 
than the seed saving, right? It is very different. Seed savers, we save a lot of tomatoes. And, <laughs> and the, good, the good news is we save a lot of tomato seed. The bad news is you can't eat the tomatoes after we squeeze them and take the seed from them. So some of our staff is a little disappointed. But the good news is we can eat all the apples we want because mm -hmm. we're not saving the seeds from the apples. How we propagate our orchard is through grafting. Mm -hmm. If we would take the seed from this apple, for instance, uh, bees would have been going from many, many different trees. We have 700 varieties here, so they would have gone from a lot of different blossoms and the seed in this apple would be a result of that, a, of a crossing. Cross yes. So to get the true uh, variety back and keep the integrity and the history, um, we graft it. There are a lot of commercial nurseries that are coming back to that because their customers are wanting the older varieties again. Yeah. And thank goodness for Seed Savers Exchange, you guys are making a lot of those varieties available to consumers to try for the very first exactly. time and then create that demand. Right. Heritage Farm itself is a model, we hope, for people to walk through and say, I could have a, a heirloom apple in my a apple tree in my backyard. I'm going to have an apple tree, so why not have that one? Mm -hmm. And that's what it's really all about. Uh, saving diversity isn't a gene bank and it isn't all here at the, in this orchard, although it's very important. It's really about people growing these things again and bringing them to life with their stories, bringing them to their table, and, and being part of their food that they produce for their family. And healthy food. And healthy too. food, <laughs> exactly. We just pick these right off the tree and we have no problem eating it. And thank goodness for that. This one's Crimson Beauty. Delicious. Mm. One passionate gardener, award-winning author, and well-known advocate of heirloom fruits and vegetables is Seed Savers board member Amy Goldman. Her role in protecting our agricultural heritage and the genetic diversity of the world's fruits and vegetables is carried out in several ways. As an author, her books receive critical acclaim. As an advocate for heirloom varieties, her mission is to celebrate and catalog the magnificent diversity of standard open pollinated varieties and encourage conservation. And as a gardener, each summer Amy grows hundreds of different varieties of heirloom vegetables in her gardens in upstate New York. Amy, you have been growing heirloom vegetables and saving their seeds for a really long time. Tell me more about that. I've always loved to feed people. You know, from the time I had my first garden at the age of 17, and realize that I could put food on the table, that I seem to have a natural gift for kitchen gardening. And ever since, my hands have been in the soil. But to grow so many varieties every summer, I mean, there's gotta be something more than, I mean, it's obviously very pleasurable, I understand that, but there's more. There, there's a lot more. I mean, it's all about the great dinner plate of life, where our next meal is coming from. And to have a more bountiful future, we've got to preserve the vast genetic reservoir that's our common heritage, mm -hmm. our birthright. And so I joined Seed Savers Exchange 19 years ago uh, and have been working with it ever since to provide a more bountiful future, become a network of gardeners that are you know, keeping those seeds of our existence alive. And you're probably the best at doing that because you have so many seeds that you save. And I was just hoping that while we had you here, maybe you could give us a little demonstration on how you do it. Might be arranged. All right, excellent. Thank you. All right, Amy, we have these gorgeous and delicious heirloom tomatoes, and certainly we want to have them again, right? We do. We want to, we want to make sure we've got a harvest next year. Yeah, so we could buy the seeds from Seed Savers, of course or we can even save them, and that's something you're pretty good at. Well, I've been doing it for a long time, about 40 years, <laughs> and one of the beauties of heirloom tomatoes is that they breed true from seed, unlike modern hybrids that don't. Yes. Here we have a wonderful German Johnson. You want to select a tomato that's fully ripe and, and comes from a disease-free plant. Okay. Okay, so this fill, fills the requirements, and we're gonna cut it open, squeeze out the seeds, and set them aside to ferment for a little while. Okay. Look at this, it's just filled with, yeah. with beautiful seeds. Now if we're gonna eat these, I'm gonna let you eat this one. <laughs> My hands are clean, <laughs> okay, not to worry. <laughs> now here we are, and there are a lot of wonderful seeds in here. Let's set this aside for 96 hours. Okay. All right, so we're gonna fast forward 96 hours and we're gonna process these seeds. So Amy, what's the next step? All right, well, we've got to get these things clean. Okay. Okay, so we're going to wash them with water, and we're going to rinse them out. 
couple times, pour some water in, and just mix them up a little bit. The good seeds go to the bottom, the bad seeds rise to the top because they're empty. Bad meaning non-viable. That's correct. <laughs> okay. So what we have here is as we continue to go through this cleaning process, the residue is coming out and the viable seeds which remain at the bottom will stay there and uh, we end up with a fairly clean batch of seeds. Now we can use a sieve. Okay. Okay. And we'll rinse them a little further and work them and see how clean those are getting yeah, now. Yeah, yeah. And then we'll just work them through okay. a little bit to remove some of that gelat that seed jelly. Okay. They're looking pretty clean pretty about good. now. Uh, at which point, take a paper towel and just pat dry the bottom. All right. Okay. So yes. Yeah, because just... the enemy of seeds in storage is water mm -hmm. and also high heat. And then we're just going to flip it out onto a paper plate, which is a beautiful drying medium. We're going to wait about three or four weeks until they dry thoroughly mm -hmm. at room temperature. And then the and last step to saving is to? Is uh, paper seed packets. Oh. Once the seeds are dry, just fill it up. And I like to put the then packets, you know, into a glass jar or plastic container, then into the refrigerator or into a cool, dark, dry place. Fantastic. Amy, this was a great demonstration from the master. Thank you so much You're for this. You're welcome. My pleasure. So Seed Savers Exchange, it's all about saving and exchanging seeds, of course. But where does that all happen? Well, right now we're behind the scenes. We're in the lowest level of the main office where the seeds are saved and stored and processed and all of that. But how does that all happen? A lot of the seeds come in from their members and sometimes Seed Savers sends out requests to the members of certain varieties that they're looking for. But then every now and then, sometimes they just come in randomly from people they've never met. Now with every heirloom seed, there's a story and Seed Savers goes to great extremes to find the story. They actually go back and forth to get as much information as possible and in the process, those relationships are formed. Now while all of that is going on, they need to make sure that these seeds are stored safely. So where does that happen? Well come with me and I'll show you. So this is one of the seed banks. Seed Savers has about 25,000 records of seeds and they store them in four locations to make sure that you know everything is kept safe. Now under the ideal conditions, which of course this is, perfect temperature, perfect humidity, these seeds can last a long time and as you can see, there are a lot of them. But let's face it, seeds are only good as long as they germinate. So every so often they have to make sure that these seeds germinate too. So how do they do that? Well let me show you. Now within the seed bank there's a laboratory as well. They've got microscopes and here they're actually raising pollinating bees for some of the seed viability outside. But here's where the equipment is. They've got these things that look like refrigerators, but they're a lot more sophisticated than that. They're perfect climate and humidity controlled. But look inside, this is really cool. All right, so here's this process. Every so often, seeds are tested to make sure that they continue to germinate. It, now it may be every two years, every five years, or even longer than that. But they put them into this device that stays lit. They put the seeds in wet paper towels and they test for the germination, the number of seeds within the population that are germinating. Now they had a baseline rate so that they knew they had a certain amount of viability. But when that number drops off through this testing significantly, they know that it's time to regenerate these seeds. And that's where the growing bed comes in. If you ever come to Seed Savers, you're gonna see a lot of these growing beds all throughout the property. There's roughly 30 to 60 at any one time on 23 acres of certified organic land, but that's just a small part of the entire operation. But these beds serve several purposes. First of all, they're here to regenerate the seeds to make sure that the seeds coming from the seed bank remain viable. And they also serve as an outdoor classroom to demonstrate organic growing and seed saving techniques. Dr. Ken Street is known around the world as the Seed Hunter. Originally from Australia, over the last 10 years, he's been based in Syria, but he doesn't stay in any one place very long. Dr. Street has been recognized for his exceptional contribution to the global collection of crop genetic resources and featured in the international documentary named after his moniker, The Seed Hunter. 
Ted, how is climate change affecting our crops and plants around the world? Well, at the moment, we're beginning to feel the, the outskirts of what really is a perfect storm approaching us. It's not only climate change we've got to worry about, we've got to worry about you know, loom, a looming water crisis as well. We're running out of phosphorus. You, you know, you can't grow crops without phosphorus. So your focus is really on um, food and our food sources Absolutely, and yeah. making sure that we're they're genetically diverse and also really finding varieties that are going to be growing and able to grow in these changing climates. Absolutely. I mean, what we're doing is going out there to these little villages and so on, trying to collect, assemble this genetic diversity so we can use it to improve our crops. I mean, some of that stuff we can use directly. A lot of it we're going to have to transfer genes, you know, these strong genes over to our crop plants to allow them to withstand the climate change and all these other changes. So, that, I mean, that's a big undertaking and we're, we're doing that. It's an ongoing process. And I think a lot of people might um, have a misconception that you're, you know, some mad scientist <laughs> out there. But, sure. you know, humanity has been breeding crops for 10,000 years. Yeah, I mean, the, as soon as the hunter-gatherers sat, you know, sat down after 195,000 years of hunting and gathering and started to, to domesticate crops, they began to genetically modify crops and the process has been going on. It's just now we understand about the processes of inheritance, we're just much better at it. You're based in Syria, yeah, right? That's right. Yeah. And there you basically have a facility that is storing and testing different um, plants and seeds? Yep. I mean, what, what's interesting about Syria, it's right at the, the nexus of the, where civilization began. So you've got all this amazing crop diversity. So we, we've got like a huge fridge there and we assemble all this diversity in that fridge and we also test it, you know, test it for these traits that are going to be important for climate change and these other problems we have. And then we send it out, we make it available free of charge to the rest of the world, to the scientific community all over the world. And without that diversity, we're going to have a big problem. So basically you are helping humanity one plant at a time. One plant at a time. <laughs>
with a little bit of red pepper flakes, a little bit of heat right at the end. All right, we have some fantastic flavors already in there. Let's build a little bit more from the Mediterranean. Come with me, black olives. Delicious stuff. Now, these black olives actually still have the pit in them. Don't worry about that. Let me show you how to do this. It's easy to take out. Check it out. Take the olive, press your knife against it just like that, a little bit of weight, and it cracks right in half. And there you go. Pull the pit right out, okay? Simple and less expensive. And there we go. Delicious. Look, hairs on my arms standing on end. This is exciting stuff. Pasta puttanesca. And in that goes. One last flavor, guys, from the Mediterranean. How about capers? Now, capers are these little tiny berries from a shrub. They're actually, if allowed to grow, a flower. They pick them, they sun dry them, and put them in brine, and they are delicious. And they go in there as well. Now, that is so much amazing flavor. A quick toss. Wouldn't be Italian food. Smell it, smell it without tomatoes. Now I'm doing oven roast tomatoes with this. And I'll add them last. And that's just about done. Let's check on the pasta really quick. All right, so how do you know when the pasta is properly done? What I like to do is taste it. That's the only real way you're gonna truly know. Yeah, that's right on the edge. A little bit of bite left and that's called el dente. When you go to the restaurants, el dente is what you want. Quick drain, guys. There we go. A quick taste. It might be missing something, just in case. Yeah, there it is. It's missing balsamic vinegar. And mix that on in, and we'll add some of it to the pasta right now. There we go. And that's just to dress the pasta. So it won't stick together in all those great flavors we put in there. Now it's in the pasta. Guys, we are ready to plate. Here we go. Beautiful bowl. Showcasing all this great stuff, including that garlic. And a quick drizzle of the good stuff. Parmigiano Reggiano. Right over the top. And we're done. Delicious. Great for any time. But if you want this recipe, growing a greener world.com and it's right there for you. Enjoy. Well, that just goes to show you, if you're looking for a delicious and easy heirloom crop to grow, you've just got to try garlic. Besides the many great varieties, they don't cross-pollinate, so you're sure to get the same varieties you love coming back season after season. Well, after today, we hope you've learned a few more things about the importance of saving your own heirloom seeds. And protecting the habitat where many endangered plants now struggle to survive. If you'd like to learn more or see video from our visit here today, you can check us out on the website. We also have some great links and important articles. And Chef Nathan's cooking videos. And the website address is simple. It's the same as our name, growingagreenerworld.com. I'm Joe Lample. And I'm Patty Moreno. And we'll see you back here next time for more Growing a Greener World. Oh, I've been dying a meter.